Thank you. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. This is uh, my dog, Chili, taken uh, not too long ago. Chili is a beagle mutt, and uh, those of you who have run into beagles will probably back me up when I say that every single one of their neurons is devoted to identifying food in the environment, tracking it down, and getting it into their throats as quickly as possible. Uh, I've had Chili uh, since she was six weeks old, and I brought her up to expect regular portions of food at the uh, twice a day at the exact same time every day, and gently but firmly reprimanded her every time she tried to take food uh, in any other situation or any food that wasn't hers. And after not too long a period of time, uh, Chili, although she can get a little whiny around feeding time, if, if we're more than a couple of minutes late, she tells time better than I do. Uh, otherwise, she never, ever begs for food. She never steals food. You can put a bowl of human food right in front of her. She'll express absolutely no interest in it. This is my brother, Dan. This was taken uh, almost exactly a year ago. And uh, in recent years, Dan has ballooned to uh, 230 pounds. He's five foot seven. He's, uh, he was put on blood pressure medication, cholesterol lowering medication, and around this time, the time the picture was taken, uh, he was officially diagnosed as diabetic and was on uh, blood sugar control medication as well, and was told by his doctor he was on the way towards heart disease. When I took this picture, we were at the Smithsonian in Washington. We'd gone down from Boston for a family affair, and we walked around the Smithsonian for a few minutes, and he just couldn't really walk anymore. He was too heavy. Uh, he's technically not disabled, but his skinny legs just couldn't support his weight, and we had to get him a wheelchair. So this raises the question, why did my brother Dan, and indeed why has much of the population, grown obese? Now I focus to some extent on obesity, but obviously much of everything I have to say today applies to the bigger picture here as well of preventive medicine. Now there have been a lot of theories we've heard about about what has happened to make the population grow obese over the last 30 years. I think that as far as mysteries go, it is the least mysterious mystery in the history of science. This picture was taken a little bit later after the Smithsonian. The reason uh, that the population is becoming obese is that for the first time in history, uh, most people now have unrestrained access to delicious high calorie foods and little reason or opportunity to be physically active. Now, the differences between my dog Chili's and my brother Dan's feeding behaviors, I believe were uh, perfectly explained about 65 years ago by this fellow, uh, that's B.F. Skinner. And in a nutshell, uh, what B.F. Skinner said is that in the end, ultimately, all organisms will do what the environment, that is, the world around you, uh, prompts you to do and rewards you to do, and you'll avoid those things that the environment punishes you for doing. Uh, Skinner dominated the field of psychology uh, through much of the 50s and into the 60s, but then he was pretty mercilessly and widely attacked by a lot of his colleagues, uh, and I think for, for pretty good reason, uh, which is that behaviorism, Skinner's, uh, the, the field he essentially invented, uh, really is not a great source of interesting academic papers. Skinner basically showed why we really probably shouldn't be spending all our time wondering about why people think, what they're thinking, where the thoughts come from, where their feelings come from, that you can actually do much better taking a shortcut and going straight to their behavior. It's observable, it's measurable, you can compare it to what you measure in the environment, and he showed again and again in hundreds of studies, and since then in thousands and tens of thousands of studies, it works. You can change people's behavior by changing the environment around them. However, what this did was essentially short circuit what everybody else in psychology was working on. And as a result, uh, he was widely attacked. Now, meanwhile, the public also became, uh, at first, very enamored of uh, Skinnerian behaviorism, 
But ultimately, people decided that they didn't like the idea that they could be programmed, that human beings can be trained like a dog. Uh, and in fact, the, the field of behaviorism, and particularly uh, uh, behavior analysis, which is technically what Skinner's field was called, it might have died altogether if it weren't for the fact that it was discovered in uh, around 1990 that uh, behaviorism was pretty much the only treatment that works with children with autism. Uh, and even today, although the uh, behavior analysis is an extraordinarily effective treatment with these children, it works miracles, uh, a lot of parents of children with autism still dislike it for the same reason. They feel their children are being trained like animals. Uh, but parents in general of children with autism don't have much choice because it's the standard of care treatment, it's what's insured, and it actually works and no other treatment does. But the rest of us do have a choice. And in general, by and large, when we have a choice, we choose not to be programmed. We choose not to be trained. Instead, what we do is we look for choice. We want to be able to exert our decision-making ability. We want to use our discipline and our willpower to do the right thing. How's that been working out? Well, that's what we like, and experts and the media, by and large, oblige us. The top, you see a couple of major cover stories in the New York Times Sunday Magazine. Both happen to be written by the same journalist, Gary Taubes. Happens to be a good friend of mine. I think he's the most dangerous man alive. Uh, the story on the left told us that all our problems are caused by eating carbs. The story on the right, another cover story, told us that all our problems are caused by high fructose corn syrup. You solve those two simple problems, and hey, everything's great. Uh, we also have The End of Overeating, probably, what, certainly one of the most popular books ever written about the problems with obesity. Uh, that book states essentially in a nutshell that McDonald's did it to us. If we just fixed that horrible, evil fast food industry, all our problems would go away. Uh, and down on the right, we see a scene from The Biggest Loser, which of course gave us that wonderful role model of the way you lose weight is you torture yourself, you lose hundreds of pounds in a matter of weeks, you spend hours killing yourself at the gym, uh, and that can't fail either. Now, the reason some of these approaches are so incredibly dangerous, I think, is that there's a certain amount of truth to them. All these things are actually right to a certain extent. The problem is none of these approaches have a shot in hell of being effective by themselves. Obesity, along with other chronic disease problems, uh, tends to be massively multifactorial. We're wired for instant gratification, and our buttons are pushed really hard by food, the wrong foods, of course. Uh, and we get that message from everywhere we look in the environment today. Now, uh, if the environment doesn't push us towards not eating unhealthy food, if the environment doesn't push us towards exercising in some way, most of us in the end, the vast majority of us, simply aren't going to be able to stick with any program of weight loss or indeed for managing chronic disease. Uh, however, today the environment pushes us almost entirely in the wrong direction. We're pushed towards unhealthy eating and exercise behaviors and indeed all sorts of unhealthy behaviors. Uh, we have junk food around us. We, of course, part of the problem is there are now so many obese people around us that it feels okay to be obese. Uh, we know that in a sense, uh, bad behavior is contagious. We tend to do what the people around us do. Uh, we get terrible messages from the media, as I was just saying, and we live in a culture of mindless consumption of food. Uh, meanwhile, we have a medical system that is almost entirely focused on treatment instead of prevention. Their attitude essentially is, while we'd like you to behave better, we know there isn't much we can do about it, so we'll ignore it, but we just want you to know, uh, us in medicine will be here to fix you after you get sick. Uh, now, you can lose weight with just about any diet or gimmick. Almost anyone can. 
but the ultimate onslaught of the wrong environmental messages, the wrong environmental cues, the wrong environmental contingencies, that is, what you get rewarded for or punished for, uh, pretty much assures that we'll keep returning to the unhealthy behavior. There are no breaks on the bad eating habits and the lack of exercise. People end up regaining the weight. We get uh, a tremendous amount of misleading information and bad guidance from everyone around us who should know better, and it's really frustrating because we know what the answer to this problem is. Skinnerian conditioning works. Now, I've actually traveled across the country and around the world investigating programs where there seems to be a lot of success in helping people lose weight permanently, and in every one of these programs I've gone to, I hear the same thing over and over again. They use essentially the same techniques. Uh, the guy on the top, that's Daniel Kirschenberg, he's a, a uh, psychiatrist at Northwestern University, runs an incredibly successful program in Chicago, uh, especially for children. He's helped thousands of people uh, take weight off permanently. Basically, he just helps them change their behaviors. Uh, in the bottom, that was a Chinese clinic outside of Beijing. They've helped thousands of people, and they've been doing it for decades. Uh, those four women have already, between them, lost hundreds of pounds, and they do it exactly the same way. They just give people healthy foods and get them walking. And the changes last for years and years and years. Now that, in the end, of course, is anecdotal information. This is a paper that came out uh, not too long ago uh, in, uh, I believe that was in Science Magazine, it might have been Nature, I forget. Uh, but anyway, preliminary results from what is, uh, I think most people will ultimately agree, the best, most important study of obesity and how to deal with it ever conducted. It's been going on now for 10 years. It's called the Look Ahead Study. Thousands of people have been put in a randomized control trial where essentially classic Skinnerian conditioning behavior change techniques have been used to help these people lose weight compared to a group who didn't get those techniques. And the study where the results will be out uh, within two years, but I've been speaking to people about the preliminary results and it is absolutely clear at this point that these techniques help people take weight off and keep it off for a decade. And this is a large randomized control trial. This is the gold standard, folks. This is what's going to prove it once and for all, as if we really needed more proof, but nonetheless, there it is. Now, I talk about classical Skinnerian conditioning. Uh, actually, a lot of the people I speak to, I'd probably, in fact, say most of the people who are doing absolutely the right thing, and all these clinics I visited, academics who totally believe in this behavior change, generally say they have nothing to do with Skinner. Many of them aren't really even familiar with what Skinner said. And what you hear a lot about now is uh, behavioral economics, various cognitive psychology theories, uh, social network theory, and sometimes just plain good weight loss advice about behavior change. But in the end, I found it always boils down to classical Skinnerian conditioning. Who cares what we call it? Who cares what you think of Skinner? If it works, it's what we need to do. Now, the problem with these clinics is that they're expensive. It involves personal coaching, and this is true of the look-ahead trial as well. Uh, you get careful management of your case as an individual by professionals, typically by a physician, a psychologist, or someone who is a very highly credentialed professional, typically a team of professionals, and that translates to big bucks. Uh, and you get a lot of face time with these people on a regular basis. And in fact, what you end up with in many cases is essentially modern versions of the classic fat camp. And yes, you can absolutely lose weight, you can have your behavior changed, it can last a lifetime. Uh, but what's really going on here is people, when they're put in these very intensive programs that involves all this face time with expensive professionals, is they're essentially being put in a Skinner box. Now, many of you may know that a uh, Skinner box is essentially uh, uh, the idea that you literally put an organism in a box where the experimenter can control all the inputs and carefully observe 
what the outputs are and behavior, and then you can tweak the environment and you're not distracted by things uh, that will push the organism away from the behaviors you're looking for. Skinner boxes work great. And essentially, when you put someone into a clinic like this or in a program like this, you are tightly controlling their environment. In other words, these more intense programs are essentially complex realizations of a Skinner box made real, where we can control the inputs and contingencies of the environment. This is my brother Dan today. I took this picture about a week ago at a family dinner. He's down to 165 pounds. He's off all his medications. He is no longer diabetic. He walks every day. He eats balanced, healthy meals in normal portions. Uh, he did not take any weight loss drugs. He did not have weight loss surgery. He says, and I believe him, that he's never unduly hungry. He certainly doesn't act as if he's obsessed with food. Uh, in fact, in all ways, I find that his eating behavior now is remarkably like my dog Chili's eating behavior. Dan lost the weight on a classical Skinnerian conditioning program run by this fellow, his name is Michael Cameron. He's a former Harvard uh, psychiatrist. He uh, founded and ran one of the most uh, uh, foremost behavior analysis programs at a college in America, at Simmons College in Boston. And he's now the head of a large group of clinics that specialize in helping children with special needs using behavior analysis. Uh, Cameron developed the program that my brother Dan went on uh, largely based on experiences in treating his own obesity, Michael Cameron's own obesity. He lost 100 pounds about 10 years ago simply by using Skinnerian techniques on himself, and he developed a program around it. Now, the important point is that my brother Dan has never met Michael Cameron. My brother Dan has never met any professional involved in weight loss regarding his own weight loss. He has not attended a single group meeting. He has never pulled out a book where he can count calories, and he has never written down in a journal what he eats. Everything in Michael Cameron's program and that my brother Dan has done takes place on his smartphone and on his laptop computer. He video conferences with Michael Cameron and with his support groups. He talks to everybody by email. All his calories are tracked on his smartphone. Uh, and uh, all his exercise, his walking is tracked on his smartphone as well. Uh, this is just a random example of a smartphone application. It's not the one that he actually uses. Dan's smartphone and his laptop has essentially transformed his environment into what I think of as a virtual Skinner box. The box travels around with him wherever he is. Now, the technology promise here is enormous, but I don't think we should start thinking it's gonna be a solution in and of itself. We don't wanna fall into the same trap of saying this is the solution. Now, this is a little chart. You've probably seen 50 different versions of this. Uh, this is my own. Um, uh, it's not necessarily better than anyone else's, but basically in the vertical axis, what we're looking at is I think the journey that most people have to go through when they're changing their behavior. Uh, first they become aware of it, and then they start to uh, uh, really decide they want to do something about it. They start to make attempts, then they start to actually try to change their habits, uh, then their habits actually become stable, and finally their behavior is locked in, uh, hopefully for a lifetime. And down on the bottom axis, uh, the horizontal axis, look at what some of the key influences are. We all enter this journey with a certain amount of inherent motivation, uh, and then uh, we can certainly be affected uh, by education, what we hear from people. That's, I think, the stage where sort of society is in now. It's a lot of talk, a lot of messages. Then you start seeing people that you hang with doing things. That has a huge influence in you. And then the institutions around you start to change. And then finally, it's happening everywhere in society. We saw something like this happen, for example, with uh, the anti-smoking movement. Uh, and over time, very, very, very roughly speaking, I have the curve, of course, moving up and to the right, uh, that the more this moves towards this being embedded in society, then the further along people are likely to go in that journey. 
Uh, now, I think uh, that contrary to what we often hear, and in fact, even in the workshops yesterday, there were some lively discussions about, does this work better than that? I, I don't think any one approach will work. I think we end up wasting a lot of time debating the relative merits of where sh we should be attacking this problem. I think we have to attack it everywhere, on all fronts, at once. We have to throw everything, including the kitchen sink, at this problem if we're going to have a chance of making this work. Now, I do think, having said that, there's a sweet spot for us right now, and I think it's at the institutional level. Now, this uh, is a school community garden uh, that I visited in Denver. I was a little skeptical at the idea, we hear a lot about this, that if you get kids involved in gardening, that somehow this is gonna get them excited about uh, healthy eating behaviors, and they're gonna pass it on to their families and the communities. Uh, that, that sounded like wishful thinking to me, but I visited some of these programs, and I got to tell you, it really seems to work. These kids can't tell you enough about all the varieties of squash they grow. Uh, their families have totally gotten into it now. This community is continually attending stuff run by the school with all this fresh food being showcased, and they're eating different meals at home. I, I don't think there's any question that this kind of stuff can work. And obviously, with schools as an institution, I mean, what a great place to tackle this problem. Another great place to tackle this problem is with employers. We see some of the largest companies doing this now, but it hasn't yet moved to small and medium-sized companies. And especially with some of the technologies that some of you folks are offering, I think there's a real opportunity here so that people hear it in the work environment, where many of us spend at least eight hours, and of course, in many cases, 12 hours a day. If, uh, regardless of what's happening outside work, if we're getting the wrong message at work, we're in trouble. It's a great place to hit people with behavior change. In addition, I think we're not paying enough attention to the food industry, or rather, we're paying the wrong kind of attention. We're assuming that the junk food industry is the enemy. I disagree. I've spoken to these people. They're desperate to be on the side of the angels. They don't really care how they make money, they do want to make money. They won't do anything if it means they're going to lose a lot of money on it. And what we're asking the junk food industry to do right now is commit suicide, and they won't do it. They're not going to stop selling junk food. The, the junk food industry would love to sell health food. We just have to help them find a way to make money doing it. They keep trying. Hardly any large restaurant chain out there has done more than McDonald's to offer healthy options in its restaurants. They put a tremendous amount of work into it. They put huge marketing campaigns behind it. It keeps failing. That's not McDonald's fault. We need to work with those companies. And I don't need to tell you folks that a real sweet spot is the healthcare system. Uh, uh, as uh, Michael mentioned, I wrote a big article for The Atlantic about why a lot of the best health care going on is in alternative medicine. It's not because I believe or that I think there's much evidence that the core physical treatments of alternative medicine, such as homeopathy and acupuncture, actually work as advertised. I think they do work, but uh, I think the evidence is clear that they work by the placebo effect. But the reason I sung the praises of alternative medicine is that, by and large, the practitioners of alternative medicine uh, focus on bonding with patients and changing attitudes and behaviors. Whereas what we know is physicians in the mainstream healthcare system, not only are they not incentivized to do so, they're essentially disincentivized to spend time talking with people about their behavior. They're penalized for it econ uh, economically. We have to change that clearly. And a lot of people want to change it at many levels. The biggest predictor of success, and this has been shown in study after study after study, in a behavior change program, is whether or not the people trying to undergo the behavior change believe, have confidence in the fact that they can stick with the program and that if they do, they will get the, the results that they want. I think all of us here are clearly motivated to help people do that. On the other hand, we have to be careful to make sure we're applying that same advice to ourselves. And I think what that means is we have to avoid thinking small. We have to think big. 
this is going to require a massive change on many fronts, on many aspects of what society does. It has to be implemented in many forms and in many ways. That means we have to make sure we keep at it. We have to make sure we're convinced it will work. It's going to be a long, slow battle. Results will be a long time in coming. But I believe if it works on a beagle and it works on my brother Dan, it can work on anybody. Thank you. Now, I believe uh, we've built in some time for some questions. I'd love to hear some questions, comments, challenges. Yes. Yes. Certainly, yeah. I, I think the uh, it's so so. Uh, I I said that institutions are the sweet spot, um, it, and let me clarify. I didn't necessarily uh, mean that that is the most important one to change. I think it's a combination of how important it is to change that and the opportunity to actually do something about it. I think social circles are enormously important. I think that's been shown in many, many studies. And we know this intuitively, that people are very affected by what they see around them. Uh, if you grow up in a town where your parents, your siblings, your neighbors, your friends, the police you see, your doctors are all obese, but what chance do you have of really being someone who's going to be highly motivated to not be obese? So I think it is enormously important. The problem is, what do we really do about changing social circles? And I think now we're talking about uh, if you isolate social circles away from institutions or education, I mean, it's really going to be changing one person at a time. And as, as you change people's behaviors, you're automatically affecting their social circles. Now, a lot of the great, for example, games that some of you folks are, are developing here, which I think are just terrific, uh, sort of can get social groups together into supporting each other. And that's a really big deal. But I think what I've seen so far is the best opportunity for doing this is in some of the institutions to get schools doing this, to get uh, uh, having this happen in the workplace, and then that sort of overlaps with social circles as well. I think it's harder to do it with a whole family, with a neighborhood. There are ways of doing this, but those types of social circles I just think are harder to get at. So that was my point about that. Would you disagree or? Redefining the social circles. Yes, so they include the people in your support groups through your smartphone and laptop. Absolutely. Yes, I agree. I agree. Yes. Yes. Uh, so uh, how do we incentivize people and what sort of incentive models actually work? Uh, and uh, I see some of you are smiling out there because I, I, uh, I tend to get into arguments very quickly with people about this. People uh, in this field and in general have really strong beliefs about this question. What sort of incentives work and what don't? Uh, let me get right to the, cut right to the chase here. Uh, I believe that uh, it's a big mistake to start putting a lot of energy and effort into thinking uh, trying to develop theories about what sort of incentives work and what sort don't. I think the only really good general statement you can make is it depends. It depends on the situation. It depends on the person. And even worse than that, it changes over time for the same person in the same situation. I think you constantly have to be flexible about incentives. Some people in some situations are highly incentivized by money. Uh, it's ridiculous to say that money doesn't work. It absolutely works. I can think of many situations when I'm incented by five bucks 
to do something. There are many situations where I would be absolutely insulted if I were offered $10,000 to do something. Sometimes money works, sometimes it doesn't. And you can say that about any incentive. And I think the key is, and one of the reasons, for example, that behavior analysts have been so successful in working with children with autism is they don't go in knowing in their minds what the right incentives are. They find out, they observe, they measure, and they change as they make observations. So incentivizing properly is a matter of trying many things, observing the results, and then uh, uh, adjusting as you go along. Did, did that answer your question? Okay, good. Yes? So congratulations to your brother, and I guess to you for doing a great job training your job. Thank you. Yeah, well, I, I mean, uh, so, uh, well, in what I would call a good Skinnerian behavior change program, the success rates are phenomenal, and we've got the data to back that up. That look-ahead study shows that, uh, on average, the group was able to take off significant amounts of weight and keep it off for 10 years. And this, by no means, was the best kind of program you could do. It was an intense program. It didn't involve doctor care, uh, an expensive program. But we could do a lot better than that. And they didn't have access to good high-tech tools in this program either. So when the programs are done right, uh, right, the success rates skyrocket. Now, I think my brother Dan, of course, you, it's silly to use one person uh, to really represent uh, you know, what happens in general in society. But I will say my brother Dan is a great case study because he is a really impulsive person. Uh, he has terrible discipline in many areas. I could list all the problems in his life he causes himself through his terrible behavior. He's never fixed anything in his life. He's a great guy, I love the guy. Uh, uh, and he's a good family man. But he just is, ter he's the worst kind of person I knew that Cameron's program would work with him. Nobody fails on Cameron's program, and he takes all kinds of people. I knew it would work for Dan, and it did. And so the reason we have such terrible results in behavior loss programs is because the programs are bad. I think it's that simple. Yes, uh, down at the end. Um, did you consider, uh, so you're really emphasizing the behavioral aspect, um, yes. which I think you're making a, um, a solid case for, but did you consider um, the cognitive part that comes into play and the experiential part that comes into play for human beings in where Skinner studied rats and we do have brains and uh, different brains, larger brains that um, reflect. So my, in my reading of the literature, I've seen that also cognitive therapies can be very beneficial. And um, there are other more human issues that complicate weight and self-image, such as history of abuse for some folks. So I, I guess I'm, maybe I'm resisting a little bit the simplification that this is all about stimulus and response. Did you consider that? Yes, uh, quite a bit. Uh, actually, Skinner did too, but uh, I, I don't want to, uh, I can get off talking all day about how Skinner was misunderstood. But, but the point is, um, I actually uh, don't mean to say that the cognitive stuff doesn't matter. I think ultimately, over time, we'll figure the cognitive stuff out, and that's how we'll solve this problem. But I think that could take 200 years before we really figure out how the human brain works and what we can do to push the right buttons by getting at how people think. And that was really Skinner's point, too. It's not that it doesn't matter. It's that we don't know what to do about it, that approaches generally that focus on what we think and what we feel tend to fail. And we've seen that spectacularly and clearly proven over 100 years of psychotherapy. Now, there are cognitive techniques. Cognitive behavioral therapy has a pretty good success rate. Uh, I would argue, well, it's because of the behavioral part. But however, there are some cognitive techniques that do work, that can be effective. You mentioned the special case, for example, of abuse. Absolutely. I say, again, let's throw the kitchen sink at this. Whatever works, let's do it. It's been proven that focusing on the behavior is an especially effective way of doing it. Um, it's slower and harder if you're looking at emotions and cognition. But to the extent it works, let's do it. I firmly believe it can help. Yes. Thanks. Yes, I'll tell them. <laughs> um, 
can you just talk a little bit more about that time period leading up to when Dan decided to engage in this program and what were the elements related to him actually deciding to engage in the program? Can you talk a little bit more about yes, that? Yes, uh, that, that's an excellent question. Uh, in that regard, Dan is probably a terrible case study because of me. Uh, uh, you know, I'm his older brother. He's my baby brother. He he, he kind of looks up to me, and uh, I, I always use that power carefully with my brother Dan uh, because I've learned over my life he listens to me, and, and I think one of the reasons is I don't often bother him about things. Uh, I don't give him grief about the many, many things I'd love to give him grief about. But I finally sat him down, and I said, Dude, you're killing yourself. You've gotten really obese. You're diabetic now. I gave him the big talk. And I said, I know a guy who can fix this problem. Do it for yourself. Do it for your kids. I mean, let's, let's get this under control. And he said, I'll do it. And he contacted Cameron, and, uh, and the rest is history. Now, I don't have that power over the rest of the population. So you're asking a great question. How do we move everybody else? And then you get to that, that journey business and what it's going to take. And I think that's what's going to take uh, getting the right messages over and over again, seeing your friends and family doing it, having it happen in your workplace and the schools, and on and on. That's a really big deal. I mean, you've put your finger right on where the real problem is. Great. Thank you very much. And obviously, I'm happy to talk to uh, any of you at any time.